It's day 145 since the first case of COVID-19 was diagnosed in, uh, in China. COVID-19 has now been reported from more than 200 countries and territories across the globe. 500, uh, no, sorry, 5 million, 5.32 million cases as of uh, 45 minutes ago. And sadly, uh, 340,420 deaths have been reported. Uh, India, as uh, um, obviously everyone connected with India knows, went into a lockdown way back in uh, March. At that point in time, our doubling time was 3.4 days. As of now, it's 13.3 days, but the numbers are steadily rising. We now have 125,100 cases and sadly 3,720 deaths. Fortunately for us uh, as pediatricians, uh, pediatric COVID-19 is uncommon. Of all the cases of COVID-19 reported in the world, less than 2.5% are pediatric and the mortality rate is much lower in children than in adults. Having said that, we are now seeing newborns with COVID-19 uh, and I think in the coming months, in many parts of the world, we are going to see more children with COVID-19. In addition to the usual symptoms that uh, adult physicians have reported, we have found that diarrhea and vomiting is more often seen in uh, children with COVID. And of course, we have the Kawasaki disease like uh, pediatric multi-system inflammatory syndrome that has been reported in the United Kingdom and in the United States. We are really fortunate that we have experts, global experts from several countries who are going to be uh, giving us knowledge uh, based on what they have seen, what they have reviewed. And we also privileged that we have uh, three presidents, uh, Dr. Sarah Goza, who is the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, Dr. Russell Viner, president of the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health, and Dr. Bakul Parik, president of the Indian Academy of Pediatrics, joining us. We also have the privilege of having Dr. Suresh Reddy, president of RP. So we'll get cracking with the first uh, session and I am going to uh, request uh, Ramesh Bhai uh, to give his opening remarks. Dr. Ramesh Mehta is a consultant pedi pediatrician in the United Kingdom. He's founder and president of the British Association of Physicians of Indian Origin. He's the immediate past president of the Global Association of Physicians of Indian Origin, uh, has uh, uh, done some remarkable work in general pediatrics, has also um, done much to enhance academics in many parts of the world and has been very actively associated with the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health. Uh, Dr. Mehta, for his services to the NHS, has been recognized uh, with the order of the British Empire OBE. Over to Dr. Ramesh Mehta. Yes, Ramesh Bhai, please go ahead. Friends and colleagues, uh, I'm absolutely delighted uh, to welcome you to this very important session on pediatric COVID. At the onset of coronavirus pandemic, it was a bit reassuring that the infection in children was mild and they are generally safe. However, with the time, we are beginning to see the devastating impact on children. The collateral damage on children is much more than missed appointments, cancelled procedures, and absence from school. It is, in fact, disrupting their lives. An article in Lancet last week is a stark reminder of COVID-19 impact on children. There is a global disruption in child health interventions such as family planning, birth and postnatal care, and vaccination. All this could lead to an additional 1.2 million deaths under five years in just next six months. According to UNICEF, this projected figure threatens to reverse nearly a decade of progress on ending preventable child deaths. Among the countries projected to have the highest death toll in the world, case scenarios are Bangladesh, Brazil, Ethiopia, India, Indonesia, Pakistan, and Uganda. As if this wasn't enough, as 
Anupam mentioned, recently we had a small cluster of multi-system inflammatory conditions associated with COVID in children. So to conclude, friends, this pandemic is not only an unprecedented public health emergency, but also a challenge our society and our economy have not seen in peacetime. I'm delighted today that we have a galaxy of speakers to expand on these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ramesh Bhai, for your opening uh, remarks. As always, very crisp, very clear. And uh, we move on to the next session and to introduce the next uh, speaker. It's a privilege to invite uh, our senior colleague, Dr. Sudhir Parekh. Uh, most, of, uh, most of us know uh, Sudhir Bhai, he's the chairman of the Center of uh, Asthma and Allergy in uh, New York. Uh, he's the secretary general of the Global Association of Physicians of Indian Origin. He's also the chairman of Parik Worldwide Media and ITV Gold Channel. And for those who live outside India, uh, he makes sure that everyone's entertained and makes sure that everyone is well informed because Parik Worldwide reaches out to the largest number of uh, uh, people of Indian origin living outside uh, India every day, every week. Uh, he's been honored with uh, the Pravasi Bharatiya Saman, the Ellis Island Medal of Honor, the Padam Shri, and of course, uh, the title of the Knight of Malta by the government of Malta. Uh, over to uh, Sudhir Bhai. Sudhir Bhai, please unmute and over to you. Dear friends, can you hear me? Dear friends, really it's a, a privilege and a honor to introduce a very distinguished speaker today, Dr. Shashi Kupala. Dr. Shashi Kupala is a neurologist and medical director of NICU at Women's Hospital, Evansville, Indiana. He is a graduate of uh, Rangaraya Medical College, Andh Andhra Pradesh. He has experience of working in pediatrics in three different countries, India, UK, and USA. He was trained at the, some of the best institutes of the world, including uh, Norfolk and Norwich University Hospital and Leeds General in UK, as well as Cleveland Clinic and the Cincinnati Children's Hospital in USA. Doctor has very passionate about the improving the healthcare outcome and holds the master degree in the healthcare quality and the safety management. Let's welcome Dr. Shashi Kopala. Dr. Shashi. Thank you, Dr. Parak. <coughs> Hello, everybody. Let's jump right in. Um, so we all know the COVID virus, what's going on right now. The COVID-19 is caused by a non-human strain of um, coronavirus. And the genetic composition of this, the COVID-19 uh, has 98% resemblance with the coronavirus that infects usually the bats. Uh, so there is a hypothesis where that was not proved yet, but there is a hypothesis that this COVID-19 came from the bats. Uh, the COVID-19 attaches to the angiotensin converting uh, enzyme receptor type 2. Uh, it's interesting because these receptors have reduced expression in children with allergies and atopic asthma. Again, there is a hypothesis that these subgroup of children may be less susceptible to COVID-19. Uh, we have to wait and see how it goes. We don't know much about the prevalence and the as of now, there are more studies coming uh, as we speak, uh, but there's a recent study done in a population study done in the state of Indiana, in the states, and when they checked over 4,000 people uh, during the last week of April, they found that 2.8% uh, of them had infection. Again, these were asymptomatic people that they're just going about by their jobs. They are not symptomatic, they don't have any exposure uh, history at all. 
So as of now, this may be one figure we fall back on, like 2.8% of point prevalence. Coming to incidence, again, we don't know what's incidence, but there is a trial undergoing right now as we speak, that's called HEROES trial, that's human epidemiological and response to um, Corona virus trial. This is sponsored by the uh, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Um, it's a prospective trial. They're planning to involve or, or recruit 2,000 children and their family members, and they're going to follow them periodically by testing and, by, and also by symptoms. And they're going to see how many of the children are going to be infected or affected by coronavirus going forward. One interesting thing is they're also going to compare, they're going to have a subset of children with allergies and atopic asthma in this 2000 population. So they're going to compare the incidence of COVID-19 in the regular children and also the children with allergies and atopic asthma. So it's going to be interesting when, this, when the results come out. So as Dr. Sibal said, as of now, uh, children uh, may not be the uh, high risk category, um, but, but the data is ever changing. We have to wait for more studies to come out. As of now, uh, large data from various countries uh, have shown that the, the children under 18 years of age um, are uh, occupy probably 0.8 to 2.4% of all the total positive cases. It doesn't mean uh, they're symptomatic, but it just means they had infection. They got COVID-19 at some stage, either recent or in the past. The, coming to the clinical presentation, COVID-19 uh, presents in children just like any other virus in the viral illnesses. Uh, it, presents, it can present with respiratory issues, gastrointestinal issues, uh, rash. The most common symptoms are fever, cough, and cough, and and it can also, they can also have sore throat, rhinorrhea, uh, pneumonia-like illness, um, or diarrhea, vomiting, or any kind of rash, uh, non-specific rash, morbidly form rash, target lesions, just like any other viral illness, really. But the good thing is. Uh, most of the children have been asymptomatic or have only signs of um, mild illness. In a case series of 74 children from China, Wu and colleagues found that 27% uh, of them were asymptomatic. 32% of them had showed signs of acute upper respiratory illness and 39% of them showed mild pneumonia, and only one out of the 74 had features of severe pneumonia. That's reassuring. And again, uh, another large study involving more than 2,100 children, again from China, uh, Don and colleagues showed that most of the children were uh, asymptomatic or had only mild to moderate illness. Uh, almost 94% of the children uh, were asymptomatic or had only uh, mild illness. Only 6% of them had severe to critical illness. Um, and the fatalities were really rare in this uh, um, in children under 18 years of age. However, infants under one year of age are the sickest population. In the same study involving the 21, more than 2,100 children, Dong et al. showed that um, more than 10% of the children under one year of age had severe to critical illness compared to close to 3% of children about 15 years of age. So the anger that a children, child, um, risk of illness, severe of illness goes higher. And coming to the most talked about um, uh, symptom right now, our uh, illness right now, uh, this was initially described uh, or reported from the United Kingdom and then later on from New York. So a couple of weeks ago, the CDC released an advisory on the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children associated with COVID-19. It is kind of like, as Dr. Sibal was saying, um, presence like Kawasaki-like illness, 
with no other factors or no other uh, disease agents involved. So the criteria CDC was going by were the individual should be under 21 years of age and should have fever at least 38 degrees Celsius. And there should be elevation of inflammatory markers like CRP, ESR, or procalcitonin. And there should be evidence of dysfunction of at least two organ systems. And the dysfunction should be severe enough that the individual should be needs hospitalization. Plus, there should not be any other plausible diagnosis and the individual should test positive for current or recent COVID-19 infection. Thank you. Thanks ever so much, Sashi. Over to Sudhir Bhai for the next session. Uh, <clears throat> it's a privilege and honor to introduce Dr. Tanu Singhal. Dr. Tanu Singhal did her uh, pediatric MD from the Ames Valley. She also did a master in tropical medicine and international health from London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Dr. Tanu was executive board of direct member Fungal Infection Study Forum, as well as National Technical Expert Group of the Pediatric Tuberculosis. She is advisor in Indian, Indian Council of Medicine Research, Research for the Antimicrobial Stewardship. She has published several uh, research papers nationally and internationally, and she, is, she has a special interest in multi-drug resistant tuberculosis antimicrobial resistance epidemiology, as well as uh, travel medicine and in infection control vaccinology. Let's welcome Dr. Tanu Singhal. Dr. Tanu. Hello. Um, hello, yes. So it's a privilege to be here and thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, um, I'm going to be talking about uh, COVID-19 diagnosis. So I think the first thing which we need to talk about is um, what, when, is to, when should one suspect COVID-19? Now, this is going to depend a lot on the local epidemiology and prevalence of COVID-19 and contact history. But basically, as Dr. Shashi said earlier, children can be asymptomatic or can have mild symptoms of nasal congestion, cough. They can have diarrhea, vomiting. Some of them may just have fever without any focus. And um, of course, some of them can present with pneumonias. Or now we know about the pediatric inflammatory multisystem syndrome. Apart from that, asymptomatic contacts of infected adults and neonates born to COVID positive mothers may also be tested. And the decision to test really depends on the logistics, resources, and the various national guidelines. But in India, basically, any child who has an influenza like illness or a severe acute respiratory infection, or has been in contact with an adult with COVID will be tested. Now, when we make a decision to test, we should talk about which tests should one do. So the RT-PCR in the respiratory secretions is the gold standard test. But the sensitivity of the test depends on which site you swab. So the nasal swab has the lowest sensitivity, followed by the oral swab, then the nasopharyngeal swab, then sputum and then bronchoalveolar lavage. So the sensitivity of the bronchoalveolar lavage is close to 90%. But the overall sensitivity varies between 30 to 90%. And this sensitivity also depends a lot on how the specimen has been collected, how has it been transport, transported, what stage is the illness. So if you test an early illness, the sensitivity will be higher. And if you test late, it will be lower. And it also depends on the type of kit used. Uh, in a large series of 2,000 children from China who were COVID suspects, only 33% were virologically confirmed. Now, this PCR is very specific, but it does not distinguish life from dead virus. So if some child tests positive and is asymptomatic, you don't know whether he is actually asymptomatic, whether he is going to be symptomatic later, or he was ill a couple of weeks back and now he has just has the RNA in the throat. And that is why, as per current guidelines, repeat testing to document negativity is no longer recommended because 
the viral culture show that the virus is not viable after day seven of illness. And um, there is a lot of talk about stool samples in children being positive for a long time. But again, it is not known whether this is a significant route for transmission and whether the virus which is present in the stool is actually um, uh, dead or alive. Now, what about the lab investigation? So if you look at adult studies, they have looked at lymphopenia, increased ALC, ANC-ALC ratio, elevated CRP, and many other inflammatory markers. And in children, these changes are uncommon. Now, this could just be related to the severity of disease as children have mild symptoms and adult data is from hospitalized patients. We are seeing even mildly symptomatic adults and they don't, we don't find any significant changes in their complete blood count and CRP. However, severely affected children will show the same manifestations. They will have lymphopenia, they'll have high CRP, they'll have high liver enzymes, high CPK and high LDH. So if you have a child in the current scenario who has a febrile respiratory illness and who is a little sick and has lymphopenia and high CRP with a negative procalcitonin, then one must think of um, COVID. Radiology has also been considered as an important tool for diagnosis. And here the CT is much more sensitive than both the chest X-ray and the RT-PCR. And the CT findings usually show ground glass opacities, mainly subpleural sub and lower low. And the CT changes are actually in children milder than adults. And they have, um, because they have less severe disease. But we must understand that the CT changes are not specific and they can be seen in any kind of viral pneumonia. So what is really the utility of a CT scan in diagnosis of COVID? I think it is useful in those clinical situations where COVID is suspected and the RT-PCR is negative or is not available and you want to triage the child as to whether he should go into the COVID unit or whether he can be treated as a normal patient. But we must understand that it's not okay to do indiscriminate CT scans in children because of the radiation exposure. And then finally, we should talk about the antibody tests because a lot of talk is about them. And we know that antibodies against COVID, which include the IgM, IgA and IgG antibodies, develop within one to three weeks of infection. Higher antibody levels are seen in patients with severe disease as compared to those with mild symptoms or those who are asymptomatic. But the sensitivity and specificity is also a lot kit dependent. So when we did a small study in people who were known COVID positive, only 60% had an antibody response even three to four weeks after onset of infection. So if the antibodies are positive, it is fairly specific. But if the antibodies are negative, it uh, doesn't rule out a past COVID infection. I think the main role of antibody tests in pediatric COVID is to confirm the diagnosis of pediatric multi-system inflammatory syndrome because many of these children actually have negative COVID PCRs in the throat, but have positive antibody tests, because it is believed that this syndrome actually happens late, two to three weeks after a COVID infection. So I think I must summarize by saying that at this time, a large percentage of children with acute symptoms may actually be due to COVID-19, especially in countries which are experiencing large number of cases and in cities like Mumbai, where it is very common. And we as pediatricians should be aware of atypical manifestations such as rashes, such as inflammatory syndrome, and try and diagnose them. RT-PCR in the nasopharyngeal swab is the gold standard. But one must remember that a negative RT-PCR swab does not rule out COVID. Labs and CT play in its supportive role. And at the moment, antibody tests have a very limited role. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanu. That was uh, very clear, most helpful. Appreciate your taking our time and over to Sudhir Bhai. Uh, again, dear friends, it's really an honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Suchitra Ranjit. Dr. Suchitra Ranjit is a senior consultant and chief of pediatric ICU at Apollo Hospital, Apollo Children's Hospital, Chennai, India. Her area of interest is hemodynamics of septic shock and improving the outcome in the severe dengue cases. Dr. Suchitra is a member of International Task Force of Pediatric Surviving Sepsis Campaign. Let's welcome Dr. Suchitra Ranjit. Dr. Suchitra, please. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation and thank you Anupam Sibur for uh, this fantastic organization. It's an it's a honor to be speaking with such uh, illustrious 
speakers and uh, it was an amazing job getting so many people, not once, but twice in one week. And uh, I'm glad it's going really well this time. Um, I'm going to be speaking really, there's going to be a lot of overlap and uh, uh, about the uh, same things that the previous speakers have spoken about and probably the, um, the speakers coming up to me as well. And um, yeah. so we, we really haven't seen a single child, we haven't managed a single patient with COVID, but one of the silver linings of this whole COVID business is the incredible number of uh, virtual conferences such as this that might not have ever occurred otherwise. So I think we secretly have to send COVID a prayer that we could all get such great people and discuss our issues together. We are fortunate to have such advanced information from countries and regions that have managed large numbers. And this has happened because various journals have uh, fast-tracked the publishing process and made the entire full text free. So countries such as ours that are behind on the curve of COVID still have time to scramble together and get information and get our protocols in place. So we know that COVID, we've heard that it can behave similar to the adult uh, COVID-19, albeit at a milder and more infrequent variety the pediatric multi-system syndrome. And maybe we are going to see uh, a, a few more new syndromes because the pediatric multi-system syndrome was never described in the Chinese cohort in children. It took everybody by surprise. So the virus is several steps ahead of us and maybe there are, it has a few new syndromes waiting to be unleashed on all of us. So we need to wait and see. We know that in adults is characterized by severe pneumonia and there's basically, even when they have a pneumonia, it's only lung, there is hyperactivation of the inflammatory cascade. And um, there's a lot of tissue jam damage. And at the moment, the respiratory involvement does seem to be less uh, severe in children. And this is a paper from a recent uh, the Lancet article so a patient is, uh, the person is exposed at the incubation period about five or six days. And then some symptoms such as fever, cough, et cetera, come in. And after a week of those symptoms is when they take a turn for the worse. So many times your people are uh, reasonably optimistic. Okay, he's just only needing, the patient's only needing some oxygen and settling down. But then the second week is when they get much worse and they can either become really uh, severe or even critical, a small percentage needing uh, assisted ventilation. So they can have a wide gamut of changes, including in the brain. So one of the problems is that patients with, it's like the dengue season, every fever with low counts is, is said to be dengue. And sometimes I worry that some treatable pathologies will be, uh, uh, will likewise be labeled as COVID and we may miss the boat for uh, treatable conditions. So we need to keep our eyes wide open and not be carried away just by COVID. There was a nice summary in pediatric critical care uh, medicine about COVID, a narrative review. And like all of us know, um, uh, the statement, this was mainly in patients from Hong Kong and Singapore. And they did reiterate that children were relatively severely, I mean, relatively spared of severe disease and with infants being at the highest risk. And um, the overall, um, overall scheme of things was, overall direction was to try use non-invasive ventilation as far as possible, at the same time being very wary of aerosolization. Uh, to run simulations, so that was useful at all our units, hospitals across India, people are running simulations at every step involving doctors, nurses, even transport personnel, how to do a CT, how to transport a sick child, how to intubate a patient, how to extubate. And at the same time, we need to remember that we may be focusing on the child, 
uh, all the protection maybe when we are uh, handling the child, but 90% of the caregivers of parents may be infective and uh, can infect caregivers. So we, may, we must remember that as well. So this is the management protocol that we created with input from uh, the Bombay group, Dr. Danya and Dr. Iwale, uh, Dr. Namit, our own group. So we had a nice, uh, we had a good discussion over a couple of weeks and had this um, uh, category A, B, and C to help all caregivers handle patients and, um, and without having to waste much time, uh, exactly uh, apply the correct uh, and most recent evidence for treatment. And this was the uh, protocol made for patients who need ICU. So it goes right from patients who need only nasal oxygen, nasal cannula oxygen to either high frequency or NIV, and then uh, when to intubate, how to manage the ventilation, and also when to extubate. So it, uh, uh, this particular, uh, there is uh, another box how, uh, about handling the hyperinflammatory syndrome as well. And um, so this is, so a couple of weeks back, this was, uh, this was the main news in both the lay public and all medical journals. So multi-system in, syndrome. And there's a comment that this may reflect the peak. So we know that this, is, uh, this occurs about two to four weeks after the initial exposure. And now that the peak of cases is coming down, the syndrome frequency may also be coming down but this is what I've read. Maybe people who are actually in the thick of things would be able to give the right um, uh, comment about this. So this is a super um, description, including the investigations and treatment from Evelina in UK, and a lot of practical points, including awake femoral lines, et cetera, and how, how the cardiac manifestations may behave, choice of uh, support, and uh, examination, including the uh, immunological support, which is basically steroids, one or two rounds of immunoglobulin to silizumab and other, uh, other uh, immunological agents. So this is my last slide, really, that there are many questions remain unanswered, including the significance of myocardial dysfunction, the type and role of various modalities of intubation, steroids and various repurpose and experimental therapies. And as, said, and as I said earlier, we are, very, we are very fortunate that there's so much of collaboration and cooperation in, from all regions of the world. And uh, we are instantly on the ball uh, regarding the latest modality of treatment and that will surely benefit both our patients and the healthcare system in India. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Suchitra. A very nice uh, presentation. Appreciate your uh, coming in and uh, sharing your knowledge and the literature review. Thank you so much. You're we now move on uh, to uh, the United Kingdom and uh, we're delighted to have a very distinguished, internationally well-known uh, pediatric intensivist coming in, Dr. James Fraser. He's a consultant at the Bristol Children's Hospital and is the president of the Pediatric Intensive Care Society uh, in the United Kingdom. Over to you, uh, James. Hello, good afternoon. Can you see my slides? We can see you, but not your slides, but I guess they're coming on. So we'll just give it a moment. Can we have the slides? Any luck now? Uh, can no, you see my slides? No, James, we can only see you. Do you want to just try again from your system? We can see you, we can uh, hear you, but we can't see you. Okay. Sorry about this. No problem. You have access. I share so. Have you got my slides now? No, we don't, James. No. I can see you, but not your slides. Do you want to give it one more go? Yeah, I'll give it. I'm sorry. I'll give it. Okay. 
You know, I wonder if you want to move to the next speaker and I'll just understand what my problem is here. Okay, fine. That, 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 that's reasonable. So we'll come back to you, James. There, there's usually yeah. an icon at the bottom that normally does the job. Yeah. So, but we we'll move uh, on. back to you. So uh, we move on to um, Professor Ashok Datta. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I think virtually everybody on this uh, Zoom conference uh, knows Dr. Datta. Dr. Datta was professor and head of uh, the Kalavati Sun Children's Hospital, Lady Harding Medical College, was principal of Lady Harding Medical College, had uh, the uh, privilege of being his student. Uh, he's a fellow of the Indian Academy of Pediatrics, the National Neonatology Forum, uh, past president of the National Neonatology Forum, has been awarded the Outstanding Asian Pediatrician Award by the Asian Academy of Pediatrics, has 175 publications has done a phenomenal amount of work over the last 45 years in newborn care and vaccination. We're going to request uh, Professor Datta to acquaint us with where are we with vaccination. There's just been so much hype that's been built about uh, vaccination now. Should we actually, I think we go with James first and then come back to Dr. Datta. So over to you, James. I think we'll just, your slides are on, so let's... let's um, go on with uh, ventilation and then come on to vaccination. So over to you, Okay, Jay. yeah. All right. Sorry about that, everybody. So I'm going to talk about um, just the ventilation aspect of uh, COVID-19 uh, disease in children. So just to put this in perspective, in the entire UK, there's been between 60 and 70 children admitted to pediatric critical care during the last three months. Um, and to give a... A, another perspective, there's been a, probably about the same number of children admitted with the inflammatory multisystem syndrome. That's all children aged between 0 and uh, 17 uh, years of age. And um, of those 60 odd children admitted to critical care, about 80% have ventilated. And of the ones admitted with inflammatory uh, multisystem inflammatory disease, about 50% are ventilated. And the latter group are a different group, as we've heard. They present about a month later, and they are invariably antibody positive, but RT-PCR negative. Um, and the reason I emphasize that is that our entire British, and I'll suggest global experience, of ventilation in pediatric um, SARS COVID disease is there's not an evidence base to it at all. The numbers are far too small. So a lot of what I'm going to say is, um, is, is taken from just general advice in terms of how to ventilate a sick child. So we'll move on to my first slide. So the, 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 the greatest body of experience is in adults, obviously. And it's a curious disease in adults. Respiratory failure, they actually have very little increased work of breathing, but they have profound hypoxia and they've spared lung compliance. So it's very easy to uh, ventilate these patients and they have very good response to proning, which we've all read about and known about. As I've said, though, severe COVID disease in children is uncommon and can present um, in a variety of ways with apneas, bronchiolitis, bronchopneumonia or pneumonitis. And the definition, the pediatric ARD definition, I've just now lost my screen, hang on. Um, someone seems to have just, let me just hang on one second, let me come back. Okay, can you see my screen? The pediatric definition for acute respiratory definition is the origin of the fluid edema, the edema in the lungs, especially has to be of respiratory origin and not cardiac origin. There's chest imaging findings new findings of infiltrates on chest X-ray or CT, and there's problems with oxygenation. You need supplemental oxygen to maintain saturations of over 88% um, and evident by either an oxygenation index of less than four and oxygenation saturation index of less than 0.5. So those are sort of internationally defined criteria for defining children at risk of pediatric ARDS. The most risky period for the healthcare professional and the child is at the moment of intubation. Intubation is a high risk aerosol generating procedure. It's recommended that full PPE is used. If you have one available, that you should use a video laryngoscope to create some distance between yourself and your pharynx. 
that you pre oxygenate the patient with a bag mask fitted with a viral back or viral forward slash bacterial filter. A two person bagging technique is used, a modified rapid sequence induction, and that a cuffed endotracheal tube is used where possible, and that straight after intubation, the cuff is inflated. And as others have already mentioned, it's important to practice these events in advance of you having a, a, a child, a sick child. This is a rather busy slide, but I'll just quickly talk through it. These has come from the, this is the ventilatory practice recommendations from SNIC. And along the X axis, you have increased severity of injury, and across along the Y axis, you have increased intensity of interventions. So the X axis, these are different, varying definitions of problems with oxygenation of the patient. And as the patient becomes more difficult to achieve adequate oxygenation, saturations, you progress up through different color bands, starting with CPAP, non-invasive ventilation. And then when you get early intubation is, adv is recommended, advocated in patients in which you can't achieve a PaO2 to Fi2 ratio of greater than 150. And then it's suggested that you intubate, as I've said, with a cuff tube. And then if these are, anyone involved in critical care in this audience will recognize these considerations. Tidal volumes, five to seven mils per kilo, uh, generally a high peak strategy, trying to limit P plateau pressures, accepting lower oxygen saturations, consider muscle paralysis in the first 24 hours to uh, minimize patient ventilator dyssynchrony, consider prone ventilation, titrate PEEP to maintain oxygenation, and then there are various sort of third tier strategies such as the use of inhaled nitric oxide, high frequency oscillation, and ECLS. So lastly, there are just general measures which one should think about in all these patients. We have mentioned the use of cuffed endotracheal tubes, inline suction is recommended, the use of bacterial viral filters on the expiratory limb is recommended to try and avoid disconnections as far as possible, and if do so, to clamp the ET tube possibly bef beforehand, to avoid hand bagging unless absolutely inevitable, do not use routine physiotherapy. My own personal experience is I have a big caveat with all those things. We've got to bear in mind that actually the chances in the UK at least of the child on the ventilator having COVID disease is very small. And if your child is proving problematic in terms of oxygenation and needs good physiotherapy and saline suction, um, you know, you have to bear in mind that the interests of the child are paramount and you need to do that. Restrictive fluid management, be aware of what procedures are aerosol generating and follow PPE policy as per your uh, local or national guidance. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, James, uh, for, for uh, that fantastic overview. Uh, and we will now go on to Professor Datta and learn about vaccination because uh, as pediatricians, the number of questions that we get from parents about when will the vaccine arrive? And I think the hype that's been built about crown vaccinations actually scary. And then one has to tell them, hey, listen, we don't have a vaccine against HIV. We don't have a vaccine against hepatitis C. So please get uh, and believe that you're going to have something magical in six months. I know the stock price has done really well for a couple of companies that have gone public about their, their uh, progress at vaccines. So over to Professor Datta for answering this very important question. Thank you very much for the JPO and especially to Dr. Nupam Sibbal for inviting me. Can you all hear me? Uh, can you hear? Yes, we Thank hear. you very much for inviting me for the world's oldest vaccine invented and perfected by Sir Edward Jenner has become obsolete after serving the mankind for over a century and a half. And it is needless to state that vaccination is one of the most cost effective method for prevention of disease. And especially in the context of COVID-19, it is very, very important that we must know and find out whether there is a earliest when the COVID-19 vaccine is going to come to us. 
My format of presentation today will be speeding up vaccine development in pandemic situation, technology platform in development of SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, most likely early vaccines which are going to come, SARS-CoV-2 vaccine development in Indian scenario, and challenges during and post-development and vaccine. As you all know that there are several institutions which are trying to make a COVID-19 vaccine and almost like a marathon race to develop this vaccine. Normally, the normal vaccine development takes about five to 10 years of time. In pandemic situation, there is an overlapping of phases in the development, not between before 12 months, but most possibly by the end of this year or beginning of the next year, we are going to make this vaccine available for use in our in, in the in the world. Now the pandemic paradigm requires multiple activities to be conducted at financial risk to develop and manufacture. And without knowing whether the vaccine candidate will be ultimately safe and effective, and that's why about few billions of dollars are Dr. Datta, could you please come closer to the microphone? Yeah. In no Dr. other vaccine developments. Dr. Datta. Yes. Yes, please. I can't hear you. Mike, Dr. Datta, please come closer to the mic. We get an echo and a buzz. Okay. Okay. I'm coming towards the mic. So current stages of development of COVID vaccines, we are finding that there are several types of COVID vaccines which are in the process of development. And we are going to most possibly find this time an RNA vaccine which will be available to all of us. There is no RNA vaccine available so far in the world. And there are various stages of development of vaccines all over the world. 46% of the vaccine out of about 118 vaccines which are being developed, 46% are being developed in North America, about 30% are in China and rest in the other parts of the world. If you see the draft landscape of development of COVID-19 candidate vaccine, which is in the WSA in advanced stage and which was published in 5th May, 2020 by WHO and after that there is no updation on this. Uh, one few vaccines, eight vaccines are in the advanced process of development and few more are also have become uh, almost in the phase one and phase two uh, phases of development. One RNA vaccine which is developed by Moderna and which is also in association with NIID, there is a uh, lipid nanoparticle encapsulated messenger RNA and which is now in phase one to phase two to three trial and which is going to be definitely very, very effective. There is a non-replicating viral vector which has also been developed and it is by Oxford University. This is a viral vector which is an adenovirus which is from a chimp chimpanzee adenovirus which is a very weak adenovirus which has been incorporating this uh, S protein of RNA and they are going to make this particular vaccine and this is also in the phase two, three trial. There is another non-replicating viral vector which is with adenovirus um, type five and this is being developed in China. Another RNA vaccine which is being developed by biotech in uh, association with Pfizer vaccine. Four more vaccines which are in the advanced stage of development, there are two inactivated vaccines, one both in China, one is one institute of biotech and another is Beijing Institute of Biotech. And another inactivated vaccine, which is Sinovac, which is also in phase two. And then there is a DNA plasmid vector vaccine, which is coming up in the phase one and two. So these are the different types of vaccines which are being now going to be available Human trials are being already conducted. Safety and immunogenicity trial are already in progress. Coming to the COVID-19 vaccine development in Indian scenario, 
India has the largest vaccine manufacturing companies. Bharat Biotech is one of the company which has got three projects. One is in collaboration with the Indian Council of Medical Research with NIV, National Institute of Virology, Pune. They are going to develop an inactivated vaccine, which is in the preclinical stage. Already the NIV Pune has given the virus, COVID sample virus to the company, and they're in the process of development. In, an, in collaboration with the Thomas Jefferson University in USA and the Veracell Revis vaccine platform, there is an inactivated vaccine which they are going to produce. They are the largest producer of the Veracell Revis vaccine. And the third, they are trying to, with the flu gen, they are trying to develop a, a live intranasal vaccine. Serum Institute of India, which is the largest vaccine production company in the whole world. They are in collaboration with Oxford University and they are going to manufacture this process. According to them, they are going to start the manufacturing most possibly in the month of September. Another vaccine company, Jida Scadilla, which has got a DNA plasmid vaccine and which is in the preclinical stage. All these vaccines, besides that, there are some repurposing other vaccines. It has been observed that people who have received BCG vaccines or even OPV vaccines, MMR vaccines, they are a little immune to develop or if they develop, they are getting the disease which is in the milder form. There are for as well as against, there are some papers which are already there, but still there are some uh, studies which are going on, especially with BCG vaccine. There are definitely challenges in the development of COVID-19 vaccine. All doesn't appear to be so simple. To develop an optimizing antigen design, which is very, very difficult. People are trying to take the whole virus. People are trying to take the S and N. There are so many or length of the protein, S protein, whether it is the end of this S protein, which are going to be taken. And all those are really very, very challenging. Now, in one of the study which was developing in the SARS COVID vaccine, SARS and MERS vaccine, people have found that there is an exacerbation of the lung disease in the human trial, preclinical trial. So we'll have to really observe whether there is any such effect with this vaccine or not. Addition of adjuvant would be definitely required for increasing the efficacy also. But which adjuvant to be used? Only one company they are using, I think, alarm uh, adjuvant. And to conduct the double blind RCT in a pandemic situation, there are many, many ethical issues which I feel. Now, whether there is a question whether it is going to give protection against infection or whether it is going to prevent seriousness of the disease. There are different uh, questions which have ar arisen. Which, uh, what is the correlation of the protection? What is the neutralizing antibody level, which have not been really even, it is very, very difficult. And whether the efficacy and the effectiveness of this vaccine and how long will be the duration of this efficacy would be last so that the effectiveness becomes whether it is one year, two years, what would be the ultimate dose, whether boosters will be required, one or two doses, because some of the companies are giving one dose, some are giving two doses. The most important will be what is the target age group. Most possibly this vaccine initially will not be applicable for children, and mostly it will be for maybe an elderly age group, so there are studies which are going on for 18 to 55 years age group and 55 years and above, and one has to decide which age group is most vulnerable and to be used. Public acceptance is again, there is a problem. Equitable dis distribution of the vaccines once it is being marketed because the people who are rich countries, they would try to get all those vaccines. So these are the questions which needs to be answered in COVID vaccine development. I think I'll stop here and uh, wait for the questions to be answered. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Datta. That was most helpful. And uh, we now move on to office practice because in the different WhatsApp groups, there have been a lot of questions about, uh, you know, 
posed by general pediatricians on how do we start going back to well baby checks, what do we do about PPEs, what do we do about vaccination. And to speak on that, we have Dr. Vijay Yeble. Uh, Vijay uh, has been the president of the Indian Academy of Pediatrics. He was president in uh, 2014. He's a very well-known pediatrician and uh, the pediatric service at our flagship hospital in Maharashtra and in uh, Navi Mumbai. So over to you, Vijay. And I know it's a vast topic and you're a seasoned speaker. So you have all of five minutes. Well, thank you so much, Anupam and the other office bearers of the GAPIO for giving me this opportunity. I've been asked to talk on the tips for office practice, well baby checks and vaccinations and PPEs. So I would uh, try and be as crisp as possible. Uh, well, we are in the midst of a pandemic by a virus, which all of us are very certain that spreads by droplet. And the R0 continues to be above one, meaning that it is still spreading. And there is no definite cure as of today. And there is no vaccine uh, which is uh, you know, available to control this uh, pandemic. And all of us are very well aware that it's here to stay. And we've got to learn to stay with this virus. And what worries us is the lot of asymptomatic infections. But these asymptomatic infectious individuals are infectious. And that's a potential threat to the healthcare workers. And that also would propagate transmission of the virus amongst the public. Now, having said that, the only way that we have to prevent this virus is preventing droplet infection by observing social distancing, learning coffee, cough etiquettes, educating the masses, wearing masks both by, the, by each one of us, indulging in good hand hygiene and using disinfectants as often as possible. Uh, Talking about office practice tips, first and foremost is we must stay tuned with the local guidelines which keep changing as the pandemic evolves. So you've got to know what is permitted in your area of practice, what is allowed to be seen, what is allowed to be admitted because India has created a three-tier uh, admission facility for uh, COVID-affected patients in different severities. You've got to start training your staff as you open up your clinics and hospitals in terms of communication, communication with the patients, letting them know the new normal facilities that you have created and how it is safe to travel to uh, the clinic and hospital. You really need to impart confidence in them. You need to train your staff as regards hand hygiene, handling the PPE, and then before you embark on starting your office practice, you certainly need to uh, have a look at your inventory in terms of vaccines and other medicines, the PPE and disinfections. And believe me, friends, uh, uh, not, uh, it is not a rare occasion that uh, many times these go out of stock and you need to really uh, be in touch with your stockist. So first and foremost, uh, many of the clinics and uh, you know, offices uh, in this country, which is so huge with a variety of types and shapes of clinic, may need some alterations so as to observe uh, proper safe uh, distancing. The clinics need to be well ventilated. Gone are the days where one could because most of the pediatricians here in our country see loads and loads of patients with a very crowded OPD uh, waiting. So one needs to get out of that and uh, start maintaining safe distance, uh, good ventilation. One could really have glass barriers like what is shown in the slide uh, so as to protect your staff, uh, which is at the front office. Uh, make provision for hand sanitizers and uh, hand washing facility. Uh, in the waiting uh, and educate the people walking to clinic to uh, you know take make use of this the second most important thing is you got to get adjusted to this new normal so you need to come and start communicating to your patients about your availability you need to change into total appointment system so that patients don't crowd in you need to take care of their safety you need to start screening the patients on telephone itself and Depending on the local guidelines, you may be permitted to run a fever clinic where you would call all the fever patients who are potential COVID infections to a separate clinic where you wear a different sort of PPE and handle these patients. Teleconsultation has become a norm now, especially during COVID pandemic. Even the Medical Council of India has legalized teleconsultations with the caveats. And I'm sure a lot many of us are into uh, uh, you know, teleconsultation these days. And it's here to stay for some more months. So we need to, if you are not initiated, you need to start, uh, you know, uh, uh, getting into teleconsultation mode. And then those who cannot be offered this, who need to be seen, need to be called to the clinic. On arrival, before arrival, the attendant needs to, uh, you know, communicate to the patient that 
preferably come with one attendant, which may be a challenge in a pediatric patient uh, because many times young infants uh, with the mother need one more attendant to drive them to the clinic to handle the baby, so on and so forth. And on the phone itself, you need to educate the people that a healthy attendant wearing mask would be allowed in the clinic. Clinic staff would be wearing PPE that I would touch upon in the next slide. Uh, it's better to indulge in e-payment or keep, uh, you know, uh, indulge in hand hygiene. And once the patient is allowed to enter the doctor's cabin, a few things that the consultant needs to observe uh, is make a quick examination and as far as possible avoid throat examination. That does not mean that you don't do it where it is required. Good hand hygiene before and after seeing patient, a good hand wash in between two or three patients or in between if they are soiled and then use of disinfectant. What I do in my clinic is I ask the housekeeping staff to wipe the table with disinfectant and the high touch surfaces like the door knobs and handles every time a patient comes in and goes out of my uh, chamber. Now coming to PPE, uh, there are different guidelines which are been, uh, you know, rolled out and uh, yesterday only the ITSA, the Infectious Resource of America also came out with guidelines. In general, outpatient setting is a low risk exposure setting and what is recommended by the Indian government and in the ITSA is a simple triple layer surgical mask uh, but I guess that is more pertinent to uh, adult patients but in pediatric where children cry and knowing well that crying is a, an aerosol generating uh, procedure uh, it generates aerosols what is what would be uh, better is to wear an N95 mask uh, and uh, an eye shield or a goggle and with or without a coverall gown but not to forget that frequent hand hygiene now, there are two schools of thought as, uh, on uh, wearing gloves. I mean, some prefer to wear gloves. Some prefer to use good scrupulous hand hygiene between two patients. If you are running a fever clinic, what is recommended is, uh, you know, uh, use of a full PPE. Uh, it will be cover all, uh, including the uh, face cover, face shield, and the shoe cover. And for the attendant in the staff, what suffices is the surgical mask and a, a face shield. So we need to balance the you know, resources versus the uh, risk and safety uh, given the fact that the pandemic is uh, still on the rise and loads and loads of patients are coming and our requirements for the PP are, so we need to really rationalize uh, the use of PP. Coming to vaccination, I'm sure you all must have seen this news in the Tribune which talks about COVID pandemic halts vaccination for nearly 80 million children. More than 114 million children at risk of missing out on measles vaccine as COVID-19 surges. CDC. This is the statement made by CDC. So it is extremely important. While we talk about COVID vaccine, we cannot forget the vaccines which are already available and which are in practice. In India, we have a huge birth, birth cohort of about 20 to 30 million a year. The gains of vaccinations are at risk. What has been done so far, what has been achieved is on the verge, in the verge of getting undone. What is at stake is polio eradication. We are at such a crucial junction and all the past polio campaigns have been put on hold. We are committed to eliminate measles and control rubella by 2020. MMR is such an important vaccine that one needs to get on to. Influenza and pneumonia can be disastrous in COVID pandemic. You know, we know from our Spanish flu experience uh, the link between the influenza and pneumococcal pneumonia or staphylococcal pneumonia. The Gambia trial on PCV9 clearly told us that using a pneumococcal vaccine also brought down uh, pneumonia caused by viruses to the tune of 17%. So there is a definite link between bacterial pneumonia and on the you know, background of a uh, damaged lung because of uh, a viral uh, infection. And VPD outbreaks are really knocking at our doors, which would give us to increase morbidity, mortality, and that would really put an additional burden on the already stretched healthcare system in most part of the globe. Now, if uh, fortunately on 26th of March, uh, both UNICEF and WHO came out with an advisory, it made a very bold and clear statement that lifetime vaccination must not end the pandemic. And uh, WHO came out with uh, a similar kind of advisory. We have a very strong technical committee with the Indian Academy of Pediatrics and that uh, gave out a clear advisory to its members also. So I would quickly go through what needs to be practiced. The primary schedule, BCG, oral pool and hepatitis B fortunately are being continued because most of the deliveries fortunately even in India are happening in institutions and all these babies are getting OPV, BCG and hepatitis B at birth. What is missed out on is primary uh, 
pentavalent or hexavalent series which is practiced at 6 10 14 weeks in the developing countries like india so we need to get back and uh, do catch up vaccination for all those babies who are uh, who have missed this opportunity for the time being one may shift to 2 3 months or even 2 4 6 month schedule but we need to definitely catch them up and then see that they are immunized for these diseases before 6 months of age influenza i have talked about and mmr is also so important we have a good typhoid conjugate vaccine which can be which is licensed for use from 6 months and can be clubbed with uh, the visit for flu vaccine of a child or you could use it with mmr vaccine at 9 months there are regions in india where japanese encephalitis is pretty endemic you need to give japanese encephalitis in these regions at 1 year of age there are certain vaccines which can be uh, you know deferred like say hep uh, hep hepatitis a vaccine or human papillomavirus or boosters of the vaccines that the child uh, for which the child has received primary doses and then you could utilize every opportunity to vaccinate the child and one could give as many antigens as indicated in one visit and lastly most important you must take care of yourself immunization of healthcare worker is so important that i would urge that every healthcare worker who is 50 plus uh, must take a dose of pneumococcal conjugate vaccine and without fail take the southern hemispheric uh, fresh influenza vaccine that has uh, already arrived in india so this is extremely important not only you but your uh, the staff in your hospital and clinic should also be immunized so to put it in nutshell office practice tips would involve preparing the clinic and the waiting area start tele consulting uh, prepare your staff train your staff make liberal use of disinfectant uh, make uh, rationalize the use of pp use different set of pp in different setting and definitely start your well baby checks and vaccination not delaying any further the primary vaccines especially bcg op hepatitis b uh, dtp hib uh, hepatitis b ipv pneumococcal conjugate vaccine flu mmr and not to forget vaccination of healthcare worker so my dear colleagues the virus is here to stay pandemic is going to take a lot of time to uh, you know uh, go away we need to prepare ourselves we need to protect ourselves and we need to protect our children thank you thank you uh, very much vijay and uh, everyone would have noticed that we have a lot of colors on the slides i guess it's in keeping we have red and blue and and lots of dra drawings i guess it's in keeping with the fact that it's a pediatric session so our <laughs> speakers be liberal with coloring their slides with, with lots of little drawings um um, we now move on to this, uh, the section where, which we've been waiting for eagerly. We're going to have the three presidents. Uh, and I want to place on record uh, the help that, and guidance that we've got from uh, Dr. Suresh Reddy, president of API, uh, Sudhakar, the incoming president, and uh, Anupama, who will be the president two years from now, Ravi, also from Ramesh and Bupinder. Uh, and colleagues in Bapio who've actually brought the three presidents together and of course a big thank you to Bakul. So I'm going to now request uh, Bhupinder to do the introduction and it's really so nice to see three presidents of the three largest societies of pediatrics in the world come together on one stage. I don't know if it has happened before and we at the Global Indian Physicians Collaborative are most grateful to the three presidents. Uh, Bhupinder is a distinguished pediatric gastroenterologist, a dear friend. She established uh, Pediatric Gastroenterology at the Bristol Royal Hospital for Children. She's been past president of the Commonwealth Association of Pediatric Gastroenterology and Nutrition, former member of the board of the British Medical Association, past chair of the BMA Quality and Diversity Committee, is on the executive committee of GAPIO and has uh, been recognized with the Order of British Empire. Over to you, Bupinder. Can you come in, Bupinder? Who is president of the American Academy of Pediatrics. She graduated from Georgia Medical College and for the past 30 years, she has worked as a general pediatrician in Fayetteville, her hometown. She was president of the Georgia chapter of AAP she has served on Community Physicians Advisory Board for Children's Healthcare in Atlanta, and she serves on the National Nominating Committee for the AAP and the Legislative Committee of the Board of the Pediatric Foundation of Georgia. In addition, she's also very active in a local community, serving on the boards of uh, uh, Girl Scouts, and a school for special needs. So she's a very special all-round uh, person involved with uh, childcare, Dr. Saragoza. 
Thank you for inviting me to take part in this collaborative. This pandemic has brought a great deal of uncertainty to our world. And the best way for us to manage that uncertainty is to do so together. I'm really honored to speak with you this morning about the health impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on US children and how we are responding. According to the latest data we have from a compilation and analysis of publicly available information from state and local health departments, there are about 42,370 total confirmed child cases reported as of May 14th. And children represent 3.7% of all confirmed cases in locations that are reporting age. A smaller subset of states reported on hospitalizations and mortality by age. This data indicates that COVID-19 associated hospitalization and death is uncommon in children. Although children do not appear to be significantly at risk for infection at this time, we've urged that states continue to provide detailed reports on COVID-19 confirmed cases, testing, hospitalizations, and mortality by age, so that the effects of COVID-19 on children's health can continue to be documented and monitored. One thing that we've been worried about that you guys have already talked about is that, uh, which new data from the CDC confirms is that many children have missed important immunizations to protect them against diseases like measles, meningitis, and whooping cough. As social distancing restrictions lift and people begin to circulate, children and teens who are not vaccinated will be at higher risk for contracting disease that could have been prevented. We've done an enormous amount of outreach to make children, sure children continue to see their pediatricians and get their vaccines and well checkups on time. I recently went on a virtual media tour talking to about 20 different um, organizations to urge parents everywhere to reach out to their child's pediatrician and continue their care. Our pediatricians here in the US have done a lot to make um, our offices safe using telehealth, separating sick and well children, having no waiting room visits and doing all the things that were just talked about. And we're also teaming with other health organizations to get the message out in all national and local news media outlets. And we've started a social media campaign called Call Your, Call Your Pediatrician. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. It's been talked about a lot, but we are seeing it. It was first reported in April, the United Kingdom saw this increasing reports. And now we're seeing it as well across this country. New York City, which has been hit especially hard by the novel coronavirus, documented 15 similar cases between April 16th and May 4th. And as of May 12th, New York state officials were investigating 102 cases. And the timing of the syndrome really suggested as a kind of immune phenomena, they appear about a month after a community is hard hit with COVID-19. As far as treatment for this, Dr. Sean O'Leary, who sits on the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Infectious Diseases, says that intravenous gamma immunoglobulin and supportive care have been the common approaches. And he believes that the most important thing is a supportive care and intensive care setting where a pediatric intensivist can manage the things happening with these children like low blood pressure, difficulty breathing, and in some cases, kidney failure. And we're advising parents to watch for persistent fever in their children and contact their pediatrician if their child appears especially ill. There are still many questions surrounding this pandemic and how best to respond. Yeah, while the end of the pandemic is not yet in sight, I do believe we are at the end of the beginning and that the best way to manage the uncertainty is through data and our continued collaboration. Data connects us and guides us so that we can predict the likely course of events and protect the world's people. I'm honored to serve alongside you, my global colleagues, and look forward to continue to collaborate with you as we do what well may be the most important work of our lives. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Goza. That was extremely clear. We now move on to uh, hear about the perspective from, from the UK, where I'm based. And it's a pleasure to introduce Professor Russell Viner, who is the president of the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health, which has around 19,000 members in the UK and globally. He is a hands-on pediatrician and professor of adolescent health at University College London Institute of Child Health, uh, my alma mater actually. He works with young people with diabetes and leads the Department of Health Obesity uh, Policy Research Unit. He's published over 200 research papers and his work has given a new focus on adolescent healthcare in the UK, Europe, Professor Viner, if you'd like to talk about the UK perspective, please. Absolutely. Okay. Just can I uh, say hello and check you can all hear me? 
Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you for asking me to speak and hello to colleagues around the world. As previous speakers have said, it's only together that we will make sure that children and young people's health is preserved as well as we can during this emergency. In the UK, it has been a very difficult time with COVID-19, as I'm sure you know, as it has been in many other countries. The first, we, the college work has been divided into sections. The first section was our response, where we and paediatricians across the UK very rapidly reconfigured and changed services to make sure that we had the space to see children with COVID-19, that we had the space to give some of our services to adults because of the adult um, crisis. We rapidly stopped much routine elective surgery and routine outpatients. And actually our pediatricians were suddenly working in incredibly new ways across the country. The second phase was the phase where we recognized how much collateral damage there was to children and young people through COVID-19. And we started to recognize that children and young people were very little affected by the virus, but hugely affected by the lockdowns and the response to the virus. Across the UK, we have had approximately 15 or 1600 uh, children and young people test positive, so not many. We have had about three to 400 children admitted to hospital and about uh, eight to 12 deaths due uh, or with COVID-19. And it's clear to us that many of those deaths of children and young people, a small number, but were probably with COVID-19 rather than due to COVID-19, uh, or at least they had significant underlying conditions. So our second part was the collateral damage. And as we're moving out of the peak of the problem in the UK, we think there are three R's or three key um, things that we need to do. Reset, restore, and recover. And they are our three aims over the next six to 12 to 24 months. Reset is to take our services back um, to, re, to restart our elective surgery, our elective monitoring of long-term conditions, and to make sure that children's services recover uh, any, any uh, services that we have given over to adults. We had adults in many pediatric intensive care units. Um, we had adults in many places in children's wards. Part of that reset is, is working out what of the new innovations we have been doing, we should keep and what we should leave and go back to where we were. For example, this is probably true for many of you, outpatient services across the UK are now almost entirely only by video or telephone. Very few people are doing face-to-face -face outpatient services, except for those where it is impossible to do by video or telephone. There has been rapid rollout of video outpatient clinics across the UK and probably 80 to 90% of our outpatients are now by video. This is an incredible challenge. It's a wonderful opportunity and it has some significant problems. There has also been many of our services running at pace to develop new ways of working. Many of these things we should keep, but many we should not. So there will be real challenges there. Much of what we have done as a college is to work with the health service and the, all of the hospitals across the UK, we, we tend to work together very strongly in this country to produce guidelines, to make sure that all children had access to treatment. Treatment across the UK is free. We believe that treatment should be within clinical trials for all children uh, where possible. And we were collecting data and making sure that data were collected on children in intensive cares and across the country. And I think it's partly it's that joined up system that, uh, that made us aware of the new pediatric multisystem inflammatory syndrome uh, in the UK. Uh, I'll come back to that. We've also been collecting data on how 
paediatric services have changed, where people have lost beds, where people have gained beds, where people are doing things differently. We have a quality improvement hub, a QI hub, where we're trying to keep a record of all of the innovative work paediatricians have done across the UK so we can keep it and look to see um, what should be rolled out further. But we have also uh, done many surveys of our paediatricians to understand how much uh, collateral damage or delayed presentations there have been, um, but also to do rapid surveillance on this new uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome. We have a nationwide regular weekly uh, surveillance system for it uh, and we believe that we will have around two to 250 cases potentially. But as we restore and recover, much of what our college does is work for members and for paediatricians. Our paediatricians are tired. They have worked incredibly hard um, under very difficult circumstances. And it's very important to say that our paediatricians of Indian origin have been right at the forefront of fighting this virus across the UK. And one of the sad things about this crisis in the UK is that paediatricians of Indian origin and others of, of um, black and other minority ethnic groups as healthcare workers have suffered from this virus more than other groups. Um, amongst our healthcare workers, we have lost um, more doctors of Indian and non-white origin than we have of white origin as a proportion of the, popu of the population. This is a real concern to us and we're looking to work with other Royal Colleges and other parts of our health service to look at how we support members across all of our members, but particularly those um, who have put in so much. And again, one of the things we're very much recognised in this country is how much doctors from uh, the Indian subcontinent have contributed, those who have been here many years, but also those who come to study in the UK. I will leave it there and happy to answer questions later. Thank you. Thanks ever so much, Russell, and over to Bupinder for uh, inviting the president of IAP. Bupinder, over to you for the introduction. Can I start, Anupam? Just waiting for Bupinder to do the introduction. Bupinder, are you there? We seem to have lost Bupinder, so it's a it's a privilege to uh, introduce uh, uh, Dr. Bakul Parekh. Uh, Dr. Bakul Parekh is uh, the national president of the Indian Academy of Pediatrics. He served as the secretary general of the South Asian Pediatric Association from 2018 to 2000. 2020. Uh, he has served as a convener and coordinator of various academic uh, programs and teaching modules. And what we have seen is under Bakul's leadership on how he's transformed the Indian Academy of Pediatrics and going digital. Uh, every day we have uh, four or five uh, programs covering different aspects of pediatric practice. And Bakul has put a very nice, robust IT system in place. Over to you, Bakul. Yeah, thank you, Anupam, and Gepio Management for giving me this opportunity. It's my privilege. Uh, uh, since the time the first case was reported from China, we have got the first case here in January, 30th January, originating from China, that was reported from Kerala. And today, we have around 1,26,000 cases, out of which 52,272 cases have recovered and total number of deaths are 3,754. But mind you, very few children are affected and very few children have been requiring ICU admissions and almost no mortality in a child. These are the cases where the total confirmed cases are increasing, but the active cases are decreasing because of the recovery and death rate is definitely much lesser than all over the world. It's around 3.2% compared to what it is in the world is 6.9%. We have categorized into three tier system for managing the patients. Uh, that is COVID care center, dedicated COVID health center, and dedicated COVID hospital. 
and we had some bad and good news on 31st march we had tablighi jamaat who spread the infection all over the country and at, on 27th april and today we have many states in our country who have been declared covid 19 free that is goa sikkim nagaland arunachal pradesh manipur and tripura the outbreak outbreak has been declared as an epidemic and because of that the epidemic disease act has been vacated because of the number of increase which is rapidly increasing last few weeks and because of which the edu educational institutes have been closed schools have closed and commercial establishments are also not open india has suspended almost all tourist visas as a majority the confirmed cases were linked to other countries and then there were various lockdowns which were introduced so now we are going to the fourth lockdown to delay the event eventuality so that we can create more facilities of admitting the patients and more icus and more ventilators and we have divided our uh, cities and countries into three zones that is red zone orange zone and green zone and now the fourth one has been introduced that is containment zone and accordingly we have distribution of our facilities available in a limited manner and these are the test statistics initially we started with very few tests in march but now every day we can do around 1 lakh tests and today we have crossed around 30 lakh uh, testing of our people and we have almost started doing evacuation from the other countries by vande bharat mission and by which our uh, indians who are uh, sort of uh, there in other parts who want to come back they are brought by our government and it's a great facility which is being provided and we have started using smartphone utilization we have arogya setu which has been uh, that app has been comp made compulsory by everybody by which we get an alert if they come in proximity to an infected patients it also informs about the best practices and relevant medical advisories and it is in 11 languages and then there has been lots of research and treatment part as well as in the equipment and we have come out with various drug therapies and mind you hydroxychloroquine was supplied in a large quantity to quantity to usa on trump's request and there are so many other drugs which are being studied stem cell therapy plasma therapy then remdesivir toxilimizumab and so many other things new vaccines are being uh, investigated and i'm sure the indian vaccine manufacturing companies are in forefront to bring out the vaccines in the near future as it has been decided uh, or rather discussed by dr datta and of course about child my things have been made very easy by dr tanu singhal and dr vijay vele by Uh, the statistics that the things which you have shown so my work is covered in that sense and we have done lots of research initially we used to get ppe from outside but now we have our lo local manufacturers who are man man manufacturing ppe is the cost effective ventilators and so many other things and probably because of the push given by our prime minister we are going to make local things available globally and of course we have a philanthropic uh, organizations which are providing pp kids food to the underprivileged children and so many other things are being done and the impact of covid 19 is mainly seen on exodus of our migrant workers food security unemployment transport sports is almost stopped religious uh, things are closed the events are being cancelled entertainment is of course digital education is almost digital and economy is definitely suffering everywhere and that imp economic impact can be seen from this uh, uh, our stock exchange which was going up and up till march and then there was a big dip and again now it has started rising showing that now we are moving back to our track and these are the philanthropic organizations who are providing various things like sanitizers masks pp kits ventilators food and so many things and the gaps which were identified by ap was the mass confusion due to lack of proper information lack of much needed medical updates and feeling of helplessness due to patients getting scared to venture out of the house and visit hospitals even in times of sickness and for that we have come out with the immunization guidelines we have come out with the bulletin on uh, covid uh, 19 then we have also started with our tele uh, consultation more, uh, free of charge uh, module which was given to all the ipa members by our association and we are also helping fellow members when they face some violence or some uh, discredit given to them by various other organizations and we are fighting for our members and we have academic webinars going on every, almost every day educating our parents uh, our members as well as we have started webinars for the parents and relieving their misconceptions and also we have come out with various guidelines on immunization on treatment and of course we have guidelines on post lockdown period guidelines so how when to open school and colleges what precautions should be taken and of course investigation guidelines and management protocols were discussed by dr tanu singhal and dr suchitra randit 
and these are a few examples of what we have come out with telemedicine practice guidelines then the screening mode more then we have corona clinical case treats and then we have covid 19 guidebook for schools and parents clinical practice guidelines post lockdown lifting resumption of hospital services and of course how your small consulting room or hospital should be designed so clinicians practicing guidelines and of course we have come out with frequently asked question books on breastfeeding and the guidelines for uh, maternity homes and as well as for newborns and of course we have got various treatment protocols and personal protective equipment guidelines also are there where which pp is to be used by whom and of course we all know that various research is going on on bcg and other vaccines and we are sure that iap is leading the from the forefront to to be with the government various other organizations and i promise at a global level that we'll work along with various global associations in whatever possible way we can. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Bakulbhai. That was uh, very elaborate and you were able to share in very uh, limited amount of time all the good work that the Academy has done under your leadership. We now go on to a very exciting session. We have two amazing moderators, very experienced who are going to conduct this for us. We have tons of questions that have come in uh, on the chat. And uh, to moderate this uh, session, we have uh, Dr. Ravi Kohli, who's a board certified psychiatrist with additional qualifications and geriatric psychiatry. Um, he's based in Pennsylvania, director of psychiatric services, a member of the County of Commission of the Mental Health Advisory Board. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. And he's uh, the secretary of the American. Hello. Uh, yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Secretary of the American uh, Association. Of uh, along. Can, with, can can you hear me? Yes, we can, Ravi. We can. Hear okay. You. We have a large amount of questions. Again, I'm Dr. Ravi Kohli, secretary of RP. And. Sorry, let me introduce Anupama, please. Just give me a sure. minute. And along sure, with go ahead. Anupama. Anupama is a pediatric and and it's, and it's, it's not, Chair of the membership of the American Association. Currently, the vice president and will become the president. Uh, over to Ravi and Anupama. Uh, and both of you are unmuted. We're going to have a little bit of voice with the paper, so uh, bringing that to your attention. Over to you. Thank you, Anupama. Go ahead, Ravi. Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Dr. Ravi Kohli. I'm from Pittsburgh. I'm a psychiatrist, but I'm uh, enjoying this pediatric uh, conference very much. And uh, thanks for uh, Gapio for arranging this. And there are so many questions. Uh, let me start with the first one. Uh, do you find it easier for uh, to do nasopharyngeal swabs in children? And what is the yield? I think that's a very good question. Unless we get a good yield, what is the point of doing a nasopharyngeal swab? Can anybody want to go with that question, please? Yes, um, I think I will take that question. Um, so nasopharyngeal swabs can be done in children. In fact, there is a YouTube video from, uh, which, which can guide people to do it. And its pickup is much better than the oropharyngeal swab. So we are doing nasopharyngeal swabs routinely. That's good. Uh, ha has the video been uh, done in the pediatric population? I have seen the adult videos, but has it been uh, in uh, pediatric patients? We have trained our nurses and residents with the adult video, and they have not reported any problems. So usually okay. the child has to be with the parent at the time of the testing. So that helps. You know how we do otoscopic examinations, etc. in children? I'll combine a few questions together uh, to make it faster and easier. Uh, with the coming rainy season, almost all the patients are going to come with respiratory infection and fever. And uh, every child presenting with flu-like symptoms, are you going to do RT-PCR? And why antibiotics are given when there is an absence of infection? And uh, what about the uh, specific presentation in infants? And uh, let's answer those three together. And see, we'll go to the next question. This, this is Sashi. I can ask that question. Uh, go ahead, Sashi. Uh, so primarily, there are no specific symptoms in infants. 
even though the illness could be severe in the demographic, uh, infants present just like any other non-specific illness. So it's all about being in and having a low threshold of food. Um, that's all about it. And the other questions are, and sir, what's the other questions, Ravi? The other question so it's coming rainy season, probably for an Indian context, with the rainy season, everybody's going to come with respiratory symptoms, fever, and flu-like symptoms. Do you, are you going to do RT-PCR on all of them? Again, it's, it's being aware and having a low threshold to test all the children, especially if the kid is under one year of age, you don't know what's going on with the, with the child. Um, so I would have a low threshold to test the children, especially under one year of age. And what about the use of antibiotics in a viral infection? You know, as pediatricians, we do that all the time. We, we say, don't do it. I don't want to do it. But when I'm sitting in the chair and when, when you have all these like parents talking to you, you feel like psychologically, we all feel like pressurized to do something. Even though there's right. no justification of using antibiotics in viral illnesses, not a good practice. Let's not do it, but unfortunately, we know the ground reality could be different from uh, what we speak. But antibiotics could be useful to prevent super added bacterial infection, which could be useful in Indian scenario. Um, Dr. Anupama, next question. Yeah, this question is to Dr. Suchitra Ranjit. Um, any comment on uh, prone positioning children? Like, uh, I don't know, adults, we do prone positioning so on the ventilator management. So can you answer the question? So, um, there's, uh, I, I mean, as I said in my first slide, we haven't really, we haven't really had any patients, but what are reading in literature that proning really helps? Although in, um, Although in adults at the moment, we are proning even non-intubated patients, even in the emergency room. So cooperation is going to be a bit of a problem. I think one of the speakers did speak about ventilation and pediatric COVID, maybe. Dr. Fraser, uh, could you comment question. on that same question? Dr. Well, Fraser. as I said, there's no evidence base globally for how best to manage children with COVID disease. If you translate what's in adults and what is generally accepted as good practice in children, yes, proning definitely has a role for up to perhaps 12 to 16 hours a day maximum, as long as you're looking for the, the proning though has risks attached to it, such as detachment from the ventilator and pressure source. If it's done carefully in children who you can't optimate for a protective ventilatory strategy, then proning has a role. Thank you. Um, may I ask this question to Sanul Singhal? Uh, this is a common question. Every pediatric has in their mind. Uh, so every child presenting with flu-like symptoms undergo RT-PCR test, and where should they be referred to? If someone comes with a flu-like symptom to the clinic, how do they Yes, so as I said, while it is there in the guidelines, it is something which is very difficult to do in a practical sense because the test is expensive. So normally what do what we do is that if the child is just having, first of all, we are doing teleconsultation. So they usually call that their child is having this problem. So we find out whether there are other sick people in the family. So if there are other sick people in the family, many of them may have already been tested. So you get to know whether you know, there is a contact which is COVID positive. And in that setting, if the child has flu like symptoms, it is most likely COVID. So then the testing will be just for documentation. So I think what we recommend is that if they're very mild symptoms, the parents are well, the child has not gone out, then we ask them to give symptomatic therapy and ask them to report if their symptoms worsen. But if the child is running high fever or the parents are sick, and uh, that child is living in a containment zone or where there is a high prevalence, then we ask them to test the child or get the child tested. And Thank regarding you. that question about testing for flu, um, you know, it is going to be really difficult when flu also sets in to distinguish the two clinically. But I think 
some information will come from the epidemiology cell because they will be testing all these people with ili with i with both covid and flu and we know what percentage is flu and if that number is very small then we can go ahead with deferring the flu test um i think i would take it like that thank you thank you dr singo and uh, uh, my next question is to dr sarahosa uh, thank you for being with us today uh, actually uh, what is your comment on uh, herd immunity everybody is talking about herd immunity and uh, what's your uh, on that We don't believe. I, I don't believe that the AP has really made a statement about that. But you know, I don't believe you'll get herd immunity until you have a vaccine. And so we're really trying to encourage our parents and patients to still practice using using masks and doing all of that. I, I know that there are some comments in the U.S. about why don't we just go ahead and, and let herd immunity take over? I don't believe scientists in the U.S. think that's a good idea. Yeah, hi. Um, can I ask the next question? I'll I'll combine a lot of questions again in view of uh, time limits. Um, what about uh, convalescent plasma, a role of T cells in children, uh, thromboembolic phenomena in children, prothrombotic uh, 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 results, and what about? Uh, immune compromised children and patients on chemotherapy how do you kind of deal with all these different situations anybody can answer uh, including the international uh, uh, panelists well i can say a little bit about the prothrombotic conditions clearly they've been heavily reported in the adult critical care le uh, uh, literature we haven't seen them in as at all really or very rarely reported in primary pediatric COVID disease, but in the multi-system inflammatory response syndrome, a few of those children are presenting or, 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 or have, see, have problems with, um, with large vessel thrombosis, particularly cerebral thrombosis. And we've seen some children presenting with severe stroke. Um, clearly in the inf multi-system inflammatory response syndrome, there is a, um, a complicated, um, I'll put it, hematological state, procoagulant, anticoagulant state, which we're try trying to understand. And the management of those children in terms of anticoagulation is very comp is not understood. And I think we're feeling our way and trying to do it in the UK within trials as far as possible. Uh, anybody wants to answer uh, Dr. Kupala about convalescent plasma in children? Again, uh, we don't have a lot of experience with all these, Ravi, just because the children in the whole big scenario, pediatric COVID, so far, at least until now, is not a big part of the So, So that's the reason why we don't have a lot of experience, but we'll see how it evolves. All right. So maybe the Indian pediatrician can answer this question about uh, is there any benefits of this BCG vaccine and polio vaccine uh, uh, being given to all of our Indian children? Uh, are they better protected in your estimation or in your opinion? Um, so, so can I take that question? No. So uh, earlier there was this congestion. You can go ahead, Tanu. Echo, Tanu. Tanu, we are losing you. Uh, vaccination can give some protection against, so did not find any protection. So uh, there is no nothing to say that BCG or OPV or, in fact, MMR give any protection against COVID. Okay. And... Um... So there was a question again, uh, uh, Dr. Data or Dr. Yalwali can answer it. Uh, any benefits of aoxicillin and livermectin claimed in Bangladesh? Any efficacy or benefit to that combination? Well, though we do not, have, even we do not we have any experience. direct experience of using these medicines, but all these are conjectures. There is no concrete evidence to say that this would really be of any benefit in this children. 
but also they, it's not part of a trial. I mean, we absolutely news reports. Uh, you know, the first one was on in vitro and all this. Company. Takes it to the newspaper, and there is a, a volley of questions from, from patients, and really there's very little evidence. Yeah, I will ask this question to Dr. Weiner, being an international, uh, you, you mentioned, alluded to Indians and African Americans or African uh, origin physicians having been at higher risk, but uh, there seems to be a different uh, risk patterns in different geophysical, geographic areas as well. What's your theory or uh, speculation about that, Dr. Weiner? Dr. Weiner, or uh, let me then skip to, in dubious cases of Kawasaki or PIMS, what are the clinical or lab parameters to differentiate those two, especially if they're PCR negative? Um, I, I will pose that question to Dr. Uh, Suchitra. I can say a word or two about that. Yeah, go ahead, please. The key features of this condition. Firstly, you have to distinguish that the presentation of these children with the PIMCS, only a proportion of them have, uh, are on the spectrum of Kawasaki disease, with particularly issues with coronary aneurysm. What we commonly see on echo is coronary brightness and not aneurysms in these children, although some have presented the key inflammatory markers are a very high CRP, a moderately raised ferritin, though not as dramatically raised as we see in conditions such as HLH, but it is raised, and in, and in children with cardiac involvement, a high troponin level. Those are the common inflammatory markers we see in that condition, we're seeing in that condition. And um, I just want to add a couple of you, things go ahead, here. Please. Uh, first of all, the age is different. So usually Kawasaki we see below the age of five, whereas this PIMS has mostly be seen in children above the age of between five to 14. The other thing is that they have reduced ejection fractions. They always also present in stock. So those are some of the other differences which are seen in these patients. Um, uh, go ahead, Anpamaji. Yeah, uh, this question is to Dr. Um, Dr. Gozra. Um, what's your comment on uh, schools reopening? Uh, uh, where are we? Because in various parts of the world, schools are opening now. This is the time they open the schools. Is there anything uh, in addition you can do? The AP yes. has come out with some guidance about what we think needs to happen if the schools do reopen. Um, it will really be up to the local communities and those health departments and the school systems as to whether they can reopen or not. But we have recommended that they have smaller class sizes. They have, have an ability to, to socially distance um, for the older children, the children that you know, can to wear a mask in the schools, make sure they have the ways to clean the schools, try not to congregate children into the cafeterias or into any kind of large gatherings. We will see what um, we, we're not open in the fall. I think we're right now. Um, I think it would be as what our um, what the incident the, the United States is opening up our economy again, and um, just on the third of lesson earlier, you know, I worry that um, a lot of people because things are opening back up believe that we are done with this. And uh, so we will see, we'll watch it very closely to see what happens in the next few weeks. Um, Ravi, a lot of, lot of noise from your system. Um, okay. um, but, but I, I think more than some of the school openings, uh, we are trying to um, make sure parents realize their children need their physicals, they need their vaccines. And if children are, have, lost some of their educations, you know, that we'd be very realistic about what they'll be able to do when they go back and um, asking the schools to really look at how innovative they can be to try to keep um, their teachers and employees and the children safe if they do end up going back into school. Thank you. Uh, this question is to Dr. Datta. Uh, this is all about vaccinations. 
So uh, which COVID vaccine will likely come first? And uh, is there any time frame? Dr. Datta or Dr. Evale, anyone can answer? Okay, let me go to the next question. Uh, there's a lot of questions on hydroxychloroquine in children. Dr. Iwale, can you answer this question? What is the role of hydroxychloroquine? Have you all been using in children in India? Uh, let's... Uh, no, well, to, to begin with, in the very early phase of uh, pandemic, our Indian Council of Medical Research did uh, you know, roll out a guideline uh, asking the healthcare workers who were in direct contact of uh, COVID patients who were in treat management of patients to ask uh, uh, to take this uh, hydroxychloroquine. But there have been subsequently a good number of uh, you know studies which were, and recently as late as yesterday, uh, a study has been published which has caution, there is a sort of a caution in that uh, given the adverse events and especially the cardiac events associated with hydroxychloroquine, uh, the recommendation has not been very uh, robust. And as far as pediatrics, first and foremost, we have not, we don't have, do not have much direct experience, and there is no recommendation that has been made by uh, anyone. In fact, uh, the protocol that we made at Apollo Groups of Hospital, uh, we had in the first protocol said that uh, HCQ prophylaxis may be considered, but we have amended it and we have uh, done away with HCQ prophylaxis. So as of today, uh, the recommendation is uh, one need not really uh, go in for mass prophylaxis as a blanket uh, prophylaxis with HCQ. Can I take up the vaccine question, Anupama? Yes, Dr. Datta, go ahead, yes. Actually, the question was that which vaccine is going to come first? It's very, very difficult and $1,000 question. But possibly there are two vaccines, two or three vaccines which will be coming most possibly simultaneously. One is the Moderna vaccine is going to come soon. Then. The that is the Oxford vaccine is the one another one and the Chinese vaccine. These are the three vaccines which are definitely going to come by the end of this year or beginning of the next year. So these are the three or four potential vaccines which are going to come uh, very soon. Uh, Dr. Shachi Kupala, this is uh, for you. You are a neonatologist, so I wanted to ask you this question. Um, any guidelines for antenatal care during pandemic? Any chances of transplacental intrapartum infection? Dr. Kupal, are you there? And can I answer this question also? Yes, doctor. Actually, so far, antenatal transmission or through placental transmission has not been found, and therefore. There is no vertical transmission of COVID so far. It is only after the birth, if there is a close contact with the mother, then only there is a chance of getting the infection. And therefore, there is no restriction of even mother and the baby's separation is also not being done, unless and until the baby is very sick or mother is very sick and for which there is a separation. Otherwise, breastfeeding is also to be continued. And this is what is the recommendation for the global authority, including our National Neonatology Forum of India and Indian Academy. Hi, I have a question to Dr. Bakul Parekh, uh, the president of IAP. This is regarding alternative medication like homeopathy, which is widely used Ayurveda in Indian context. So what's your uh, personal as well as uh, uh, organizational position on that? Personally, I don't believe in these alternative medicines, but at Delhi and uh, our prime minister is very fond of alternative medicines. And Arsenic ALP 30 has been recommended as a medicine which can uh, really prevent COVID-19. So one is Arsenic ALP 30 and that is another one is Sepia. There are two al uh, alternative medicines which have been recommended by Delhi government. It was declared today or yesterday, I think, on television by Chief Minister of uh, Delhi that they are going to distribute these medicines to all the healthcare workers for to be given to them. Otherwise, nothing much. 
thank you for that very candid answer. And one more question. There was a case report about uh, a patient with uh, lower uh, joint pain collapsed and died and then later found to have COVID positive. Is it just coincidental or causative? Didn't get your question. Any, pardon me? Didn't get your question. Can you repeat it? Yeah. Uh, there was a patient come, uh, presenting with the lower joint pain without any typical symptoms of COVID, then later collapsed and passed away, and then tested positive for COVID. Is it uh, just a coincident or is it uh, causational? Any, any guess? COVID is not known to cause uh, joint involvements. So it can be coincidental, but can, uh, we are very new to this, but this or virus is very new to us. So it's very difficult to come in in that sense it can be comorbidity more likely. But Tanu can uh, definitely in add to this. Unmute. Unmute. Unmute, Dr. Tanu. Unmute yourself. Tanu, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah. So uh, there is one thing which is important to understand about COVID that people often don't realize that they are sick because they are called happy hypoxics. They don't have a lot of breathlessness. And many of these people just feel fatigued. So that is why there may be a delay in healthcare seeking. And that is why we've had episodes where these people have come to the emergency, found to have low saturations and have collapsed. So I think it's basically late recognition about the disease severity, which leads to this uh, phenomena, at least in adults. Uh, Rupama and Ravi, uh, from Allah, Allah. to us. So do you want to just wind up in the next couple of minutes? Uh, we we yeah. also want the session. And uh, I think uh, the basic principles we all have to um, follow and preach to our patients, like social distancing masks, whether homemade or commercial masks. And uh, those are the hand washing and all those, uh, you know, we should never forget these basic things. And uh, thank you all for giving us an opportunity to have an interactive session with our speakers. And I will turn over to Antum Sibu to uh, Antum Sibu. Uh, one last passing co parting comment from me. I'm a psychiatrist. The mental health aspect of COVID is also very important to address, especially children being confined. And uh, especially in India, having limited space to, for all the family members to gather in one space. Uh, can be very nerve-wracking to parents as well as the rest of the family. But there's also a social support system in place. So please uh, do look into mental health aspects of COVID when you deal with your pediatric patient. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Dr. Sibyl, for uh, allowing us to be part of this great seminar. Thank you so much, uh, and Ravi. That was very well conducted. I uh, just want to close. Uh, and uh, before I close, I just uh, want to answer a few questions that I saw in the chat. Um, you know, one of them was about, uh, you know, need for pediatric guidelines. So just like we have for the adult guidelines that come out every week from Apollo. Uh, and today the guidelines have uh, removed uh, chloroquine and added steroids. So we similarly have a pediatric uh, guidelines, uh, pediatric protocol that the group does. And we are happy to share them should, we, should you want them. Um, Tanu made a very important point about why not retesting before a discharge now uh, based on the new guidelines and that's because you might actually have a dead virus and uh, you know having it in the pcr positive doesn't really help um there was talk about il6 and you really do need to have il6 testing if you're going to uh, take the and that's something that uh, some uh, centers in, uh, in india would need to have if they're going to actually have the cases there was a question about use of retrovirals uh, disappeared so actually on our next uh, session we have uh, experts who have actually published and uh, so there will be a lot of information that will become available and that will be on the 6th of June. Uh, we um, um, have obviously uh, there is a lot of interest in plasma and we have just started a, a trial, a multi-centric uh, trial on the use of plasma. So lots of information coming, uh, lots of information will change every few days. We have information that we need to uh, understand, digest and incorporate in our protocols. Uh, and that really brings us to the end of this meeting. I want to thank all those who made this possible. Uh, Dr. Suresh Reddy, Sudhakar, Anupama, Ravi from API, uh, Dr. Ramesh Mehta from BAPIO, um, 
We had Bhavna from API, who's been instrumental in getting us the faculty. Of course, the three presidents, Dr. Sarah Goza, Dr. Russell Weiner, Dr. Bakul Parikh, uh, uh, our speakers, uh, uh, Shashi, Tanu, Suchitra, James, uh, Dr. Datta, Vijay, uh, and then, of course, the secretariat from GAPIO, Dr. Tandon, Simran, Neha, uh, for, for making sure that this goes really smoothly. And, of course, to all our colleagues from across the globe who, who continue to be connected even though it's uh, now 120 minutes into the session. This has been spectacular. Thanks ever so much for your support. Uh, till we meet next, uh, next time, which will be on the 6th, where we'll be talking about in great detail about medical management of COVID-19.